Hi everybody, it's me, it's Jeff, back in the uh, the Tutor 2 lounge, Jim's in the basement and uh, producing the show from the depths. Uh, here we are, welcome to our 12pm, our 12 noon revision session as we head towards paper 3 on Monday. Uh, so today is a, quite a short one, I've just picked out three little mini case studies for you covering exchange rates, sort of balance of payments, FDI question and, a, and I've added one on financial markets because that was asked for in the chat in the last session. So hopefully this will be useful for you, 20 minutes or so. Great chance to contribute. If you're new to the channel, first of all, welcome to our wonderful student collective. Uh, you need to subscribe if you want to add your thoughts, your questions, your jokes, and your menu choices. Uh, there's Jim, Jim is in the basement. <laughs> He's in the building, everybody. Uh, so if you want to contribute to the session, uh, subscribe to the channel. Uh, at one o'clock after this, we're going to do a session on poverty and inequality which is, again, one of those synoptic topics that hasn't really yet shown its face in 2023. So fingers crossed for that. Uh, the basement does indeed have a very cute uh, backdrop. Uh, Tutor tape on the wall, it is. Great spot, George. Good evaluation, good application. OK, so uh, we're going to look at currencies. We're going to look at uh, three issues. Here we go. Uh, what I've tried to do yesterday is pick out three interesting 2022 stories. Of course, the exams were created about a year ago, just to see if you've got a feel for just handling unusual material. So here we go. Here's Bangladesh. Bangladesh uh, decided back in the spring of last year to move from a semi-fixed exchange rate to a managed floating exchange rate. And you can see what happened. So in July 2022, they moved, they changed currency system. Interesting. Uh, they allowed the, the, the TACA, which is their currency, to move uh, based on supply and demand for currencies. However, since then, as you can see, uh, despite some intervention by the Bangladesh Central Bank, 
the attacker has depreciated significantly against the dollar. So one but one dollar instead of buying eighty five tacker now buys one oh seven. Put another way, you have to give up one oh seven tacker to buy a dollar as opposed to eighty eighty five. It's about a twenty five percent currency depreciation. So there's the context for you. A country such as Bangladesh, a lower middle income emerging nation, deciding to change its currency system. Here we go, team. Here are some questions based on that. Can you please give me two micro effects in Bangladesh? of a currency depreciation. Have a go. A useful question actually this one so a couple of great answers which would as always we uh, we flag up some super answers on the screen as they come through and we'll try and pick out uh, some people and give you a shout out the really key thing here especially for edxl by the way they really want a very clear focus on micro effects so quite a few people talking about rising exports and increasing ad so on and so forth that's macro and you need to be careful on monday to delineate to differentiate to make that distinction between micro and macro so this is really important. Um, Ruben, higher cost to the firm. Now, Ruben, to get the application there, what type of firm? Lower levels of investment, potentially lower wages paid. However, unlikely to fall significantly due to wages being sticky. Some interesting labor market economics there. Um, so the really key thing here is to focus on the individual firm, the household, an industry, or even maybe a market failure. Here are my two answers. So I've argued that depreciation could cause a fall in real incomes for individual households and a risk of an increase in relative poverty. Uh, so the cost of uh, imported food and energy goes up. Uh, and of course, higher inflation in most countries, no, no reason to doubt Bangladesh is any different, tends to have a, a regressive effect on the poorest families and can have a direct impact on development outcomes. So my first answer there focused on individuals uh, at the consumption level. Um, George says, is the development of an industry macro, tourism, for example, that would be treated as micro because it's a specific industry. Uh, but of course, that could have macro effects, particularly if the industry grows to scale and becomes a source of competitive, comparative advantage. Uh, and then the second point, I, I talked about revenues and profits. So uh, such as seasoning there, textile exporters, travel and tourism industries, weaker exchange rate in theory improves the profitability of exporting. So you could then show in a net, if you're a net Excel student, an outward shift in AR and MR, leading to a rise in supernormal profits in industries such as travel and tourism or textile exports. So is everybody clear on this? A, a micro effect, focus on individuals, families, households, firms, businesses, markets, industries. That way you're guaranteed to get good analysis and application marks on the micro side. Moving on. Uh, can you please give me two macro benefits for Bangladesh of a currency depreciation? Have a go.
There we go. Some great answers coming through. Keep an eye on the ones we choose, but also uh, the, the the chat window where lots of people are producing some really good answers that often take a little while to come through. So we do keep an eye on those. Uh, so Vivek, Vivek talks about the export effects and the impact on trade balances and things. Jake talks about the current account. Uh, Archie had a really good point as well. And Malachi increased competitiveness of exports if the Marshall learning condition is fulfilled. So bringing in a bit of evaluation there, driving uh, aggregate demand. Uh, Polace, Polace, currency depreciation can boost exports. By the way, I prefer the word lift to boost. For some reason, students use the word boost all the time. Tracks foreign investment. Ah, I'll come to that point in a second. Stimulate growth for Bangladesh, which thrives on textiles. So could a currency depreciation help accelerate a shift in structure away from too much dependency on light manufacturing and textiles in particular? Here are my two points. We'll come on to some evaluation in the next question, by the way. So again, little tiny things, tiny Tiny make differences make a big difference in the exam. Uh, net trade. So an improvement in exports, fine. But if you say net trade, X minus M, it's just better, more detailed. Uh, the depreciation of the tacker causes expenditure switching effects. Exports relatively cheaper. Imports relatively more expensive. Should lead to a rise in export volumes and import volumes should go down. Should improve net trade, providing the Marshall learning condition is satisfied. Of course, there could be a J curve effect on the trade balance initially. And then the export-led stimulus. So a depreciation of the TACA is equivalent to a cut in interest rates. It's a stimulus, a monetary stimulus to the Bangladesh economy. So rise in exports, bring in accelerator effects, multiply effects, and critically, a weak currency, if it um, uh, stays, stays low, might be a catalyst for inward investment in manufacturing as a company setting up in Bangladesh. Uh, as a manufacturing base for exporting to other countries in Southeast Asia. And by the way, shout out to Musical Journey, who did ask me for a shout out before the session started. Happy to do that. So nice nice points being put in the chat window about falling cyclical unemployment. Uh, lots of things uh, were built in there. And of course, you could use an ADAS diagram to show this. Let's do a bit of evaluation in terms of the next question. Can you give me two macroeconomic drawbacks, downsides? for Bangladesh of a currency depreciation. Now, how much detail, how much, what can, what kind of quality can we put on this? Yeah, really good stuff. Clyde had a nice point about the, the current account and the rising cost of imports. Uh, what else have we got? Oh, yeah, quite a few people saying the terms of trade will worsen. Because, of course, if the, if the price of imports goes up, the price of exports goes down, the terms of trade may worsen, even if the balance of trade um, improves over time. Some really good points. Uh, what else have we got here? Increased costs for firms, lower real living standards. Uh, and, as, and people are starting to evaluate saying that Bangladesh is not necessarily well placed to shift away from textiles. So it's, it's highly dependent on textiles. Arhan says cyclical unemployment as a cost of importation such as cotton and dye. Superb, great application there. May cause a rise in costs and businesses may scale back their operations, hiring less staff. Superb stuff. Um, in terms of trade, Jake, is the price of exports divided by the price of imports. Basically, how many how many exports do you have to sell to buy a given quantity of imports? So, for example, if the Bangladesh exchange rate goes down, you'll have to export more textiles to buy the pharmaceuticals you need, which presumably become more expensive. Well, here are my two arguments, my two points. Uh, first of all, higher inflation. Uh, and that's a lovely phrase, isn't it? Exports, many exports require imports. In a, world, in a globalized world, that's true. And the imports become more expensive. 
So Bangladesh exports textiles, I'll show that in a second, but it imports petroleum, refined petroleum, cotton yarn. It imports wheat for its farm sector, it imports pharmaceuticals. So the higher import prices can actually offset the competitive gain from a weaker currency. And critically, if the tacker falls, inflation goes up, you then potentially cause an increase in inflation expectations. And quite a few of you in the chat when they did mention the risk of stagflation for Bangladesh, which is a great point. Uh, you could use the Phillips curve diagram to show that. And my other point is more on the external side, the balance of payments side, which we, we've flagged upon this topic for today. Uh, a fall in the currency uh, increases the real value of debt that's denominated in dollars and yuan and, and euros and so on and so forth. Many, many countries have suffered a fall in their exchange rates as the dollar's gone up, partly the result of the Fed increasing interest rates in the States. And debt issued in euro bonds, in whatever, in US dollars, has become much more expensive. And that can lead to a big fall in foreign exchange reserves. And the weak currency can lead to capital flight as investors fear a further devaluation or depreciation. Uh, K Master asks a great question What is capital flight? It's when investors seek to move their money uh, out of a country. So, an outflow of hot money, or people take depositing money out of banks. Or, or other forms of portfolio investments, such as property and equities. Interestingly, uh, oh yeah, okay, here's Aaron's Aaron's point. I've been reading a lot about Pigou and Oaken. Would using the Pigou effect and Oaken's law is something that boosts my answer? I think the answer is I would probably leave it out available. So they're useful, they're useful theories, but they really belong to first year, second year undergrad. So probably don't use them in the A level. But Aaron, it's great economics and fantastic to see you reading around the subject. The danger is in an exam that you come up against an examiner who knows less economics than you do. And that can be problematic. So just do what it says on the tin. Exams are all about structure and process and just being relentless, if you like, if that makes sense. So just stick to that. I'm sure you'll be fine. A bit of evaluation just to help uh, help the story here. So go back to wonderful OEC.world. On the left hand side, that's what Bangladesh exports. And green is textiles. So you can see that Bangladesh is a little bit dependent on textiles. 80, something like eighty-five percent of their exports is now linked to garments, including woolly hats. Quite interesting. Um, and on the right hand side, what Bangladesh imports? And you can see it imports a much wider, broader range of stuff. Refined petroleum, wheat, pharmaceuticals is in purple there. Uh, so those things become more expensive when the tacker depreciates which makes it harder in a sense to export their textiles. And their textiles tend to be price sensitive. So they don't want higher prices for textiles if imports become more expensive. And again, just developing this point a little bit further. Um, oh no, I'll come, back, sorry, I'll come back to that later. Sorry, my fault. Second topic of three. Okay, let's, let's pivot here. I wanna look at batteries. The reason being, I just have a feeling that the electric currency, I know it's come up on one board already, is just so topical. But it's not necessarily about electric cars. I'm going to focus on electric uh, car battery plants. Here's a bit of background for you. France has just opened its first car battery factory. It's huge. That picture, by the way, is actual size. It's in near Lance, which is a former mining area, which is significant. A lot of state aid. Um, Total Energy, as uh, those of you cyclists will know about Total Energy, Stellantis, which I think owns Citroen, Mercedes-Benz, a lot of investment, 2,000 jobs directly, 800,000 batteries for e-vehicles per year. There's your context on the right-hand side, the number of battery electric vehicle sales worldwide. And as you can see, there's been a modest increase globally. That curve is, is staggering. Okay, here we go. Can you give me, again, we're practicing our synoptic economics here. So can you give me please two micro effects, micro effects of investment in electric car battery products in France? One minute, have a go please.
Yeah, lovely. I like the fact that Innes and Rosetta both chose micro aspects. I think Innes is talking about the externalities effects. Really great point that uh, although in theory electric cars are, are, are greener, you then have to ask the evaluative question, where does the energy come from? Uh, to uh, uh, where, uh, what are the externalities from the batteries production? And Rosetta chose a labour market approach, talk about MRP, labour demand in the industry. Now, if you talk about the industry, that's micro. Once you talk about the whole economy, it becomes macro. And part of the reason for running these little sessions ahead of paper three on Monday, it's great just to think micro, macro, make that nice, clear distinction. So you can go into the exam with some bit of practice in doing these questions. Here's Sam's point. Uh, batteries or negative production externality, they produce a lot of waste. And Sam can probably visualize, as we all can, an externality diagram there. Uh, potential market failure, uh, partial market failure. Really good point. And there talks about external economies of scale as a cluster can form in a region for many car manufacturers. That's a really, really good micro point because you're using micro concepts. What's not to like? Uh, there's some of the great points there. Chris made a good point. Chris Tyson, I think, came in with a really good point. Uh, before the session started, Chris was saying that he's the number of economic students in his class is three, which is remarkable, really. So congratulations to all three of you, or the other two people, for surviving Chris for two years. Uh, Chris, that makes you one of the top three students in your class. So congratulations on that. Here are my two points. Yeah, there's Chris's question. How big is everyone's A-level economics class? I'm one of three people. Hey, take a moment if you want to post in your in the chat window how many people are in your economics class. That'd be great. Um, Evan asked a question, uh, Jeff, for the editor paper, would you read the question extract first before answering the questions? Absolutely without question. With Edexcel, all the all the data, all the application can be taken essentially from the extract. So you have to, you please, please, you must read the extracts. Take five minutes uh, with fast thinking, active reading, thinking this could be useful, this is good data. And I think I got all of the students a couple of weeks back to pledge that they would put the data, the, the, the data from the charts, the tables in their answers to get the application marks. What have I chosen? I've chosen the commas of scale. I think uh, Ned talked about external commas of scale, which is a great point. But the, the, the data said 800,000 batteries per year. That is production at scale. So long and average cost could fall. Hopefully that then lowers supply cost for electric vehicle producers. I did a bit of research. Apparently the average cost of a battery in the, U in the UK is over five thousand pounds. So in comes of scale, if they could bring that down to half that, for example, and then in another aspect could be um, lower prices in real terms. So affordability for consumers. There could be a change in market dynamic, a switch away from petrol and diesel powered cars towards uh, e-vehicles. All of this is micro. Rosetta's point about labour market is micro. Uh, Innes's point about externalities is micro. So you can choose whatever you like. Here's a diagram, I think, coming up, just showing the commas of scale. The point I would note here is there's clearly commas of scale there because you, the price comes down from P1 to P2 of the profit maximizing output. But make sure the diagram is contextualized, output of batteries, for example. The green area shows the increased profits that these companies might be able to make if they can achieve significant scale economies. And keep in mind, of course, they've been subsidized. So you might be able to build in the subsidy diagram in there as well. OK, pretty cool. Uh, let's move on. What about the macro effects, please? Can you give me two macro effects of investment in electric car battery production in the great nation of France? There's Chris's point. Don't forget, Chris is in the top one of the top three students in his group, talking about comparative advantage. Yeah, so if, 
this is at scale uh, emerging new areas of competitive com and comparative advantage chance for specialization and trade to lift their gdp and operate above will increase their productive potential no doubt if there's there's investment Oli, Oli's point, it removes the economic trade-off between growth and environmental degradation. Yeah, again, if you get this right, uh, you can lift aggregate supply, uh, investment in clean energy, in, in next generation batteries, cleaner bat batteries, I'm not sure, but it certainly drives clean energy. And Oli, I would develop that point and talk about the, the hopefully moving down the Kuznets curve. So you can lift per capita incomes and reduce emissions at the same time, which countries like Sweden and Denmark have done for many, many years. Uh, okay, really good. Uh, yeah, big shout out by the way for the new, for Ollie's new picture there. He's clearly an outstanding footballer. Uh, although I'm told actually that his nickname uh, in the team in the school he plays for is Jigsaw, and the reason why Ollie's called Jigsaw is because he goes to pieces in the box. So there we go. Macro effects of investment. Him and my two points. Yeah, I, I'd be I'd be going back as we always do to our um, ADAS curves. So investment. Uh, big investment, billions of pounds, billions of euros of investment, net investment out of the capital stock. Consider the multiplier effects, consider the benefits from external economies of scale. Lots of other businesses may well relocate in and around the area of Lons, which is a, an old mining area. And I think using the extract there, I would definitely focus on unemployment. In theory, this should reduce structural unemployment. Lons is an old mining area, presumably lots of people lost their jobs in mining. It's going to create thousands of new jobs, multiple effects, etc. Providing there's enough training, retraining to overcome occupational immobility. Well done on that one, superb. Uh, let's finish off. I think. Oh, uh, yeah. What's the Cousins curve? Well, just go onto Google or YouTube and type in Tutor to You Cousins curve, and I'll explain what a Cousins curve is. It's basically a relationship between GDP per capita and the amount of pollution in a country on the environmental side okay next oh yeah last one so this is our final one uh, i thought i'd just create three little synoptic cases on this for you and george yesterday in his session and our session talked about financial economics and challenger banks so here we go i thought that's this question uh so challenger banks also known as neo banks and they're basically set up to disrupt incumbent firms HSBC, Barclays, Lloyds, and so on and so forth. Uh, the early wave of challenger banks included Metro, but now we've got digital-only banks like Monzo, Revolu, and Starling Bank. Interesting, one of my students, former students, is now head of global affairs at Monzo, uh, sorry, at Revolu, and uh, they announced today they've now got over 30 million customers globally. The IPO is likely to be outside the UK, though, for regulatory reasons. Now, the next slide just provides a little bit of background, likewise, before we ask the question. Um, interest rates are set by commercial banks and building societies. The only, the only interest rate the Bank of England sets is the base rate. But there's been a lot of criticism in the banking, uh, in terms of financial market failure, of banks not raising interest rates on savings in the last year or two. Now, commercial banks need to make a spread or a margin between the, ma the money they pay to savers and the money they charge to, to borrowers. But there seems to be a criticism of banks that they're not raising interest rates on savings. According to Money Supermarket, the best savings rates are offered by the challenger banks and building societies rather than the established commercial banks. So a little bit of application there. And just the next slide, I think, just gives you a bit of more application. I went to the Bank of England website this morning. These were the interest rates on average in the UK in, at the end of March. So base rate is 4%, it's now 4.5. On average, overdrafts are whopping 35%. Credit card interest rates, 23%. You're going to pay 6% at least on a personal loan. Mortgage is a little cheaper, but look at that at the bottom. The interest rate on savings, cash ISA deposit, 2.3%, and an instant access savings deposit with a debit card, just over 1%. So there's a huge disconnect between the interest rates charged by banks and paid to savers. But if, I think that if you're going to ask a question on financial markets, it could well be about interest rates and the banking system. So in that in that context, can I can we finish with two questions for the tutor to collective? Here we go. Here's the first one. Can you please give me two micro effects of an increase in contestability in the UK banking industry? Have a go, please.
Now, what I like about what you're doing in the chat window here, and, and if uh, apologies, we can't post everything up. Jim is getting a lovely selection. But what you're doing here is what you need to do on Monday in the exam. You're using the economics you've been taught and applying it intelligently uh, to the banking sector. You may not know much about challenger banks. Just use the concepts you've been taught, productive efficiency, dynamic efficiency, profit, et cetera. Just use those, use those concepts. Some of you going further with a bit of game theory. Um, it's not easy to draw cost and revenue curves here, is it? Because the, there's no, the output is like a financial service. It's not like a, an electric car battery. Here's Holly's point. It reduces the likelihood of market rigging like that, because that's a financial market failure. As less concentrated market means less collusive behavior as a consumer substitutes, but consumers often tied into the bank and don't move. Wow. <laughs> market rigging is a type of market failure, hinting at oligopolistic collusion, but uh, low cross price elasticity, consumers locked in, loyal to their banks, customer inertia, that kind of stuff. Um, Musical Journey says, I don't, I've never uh, been taught game theory. Don't worry, you, you've got more than enough. Uh, and Ned says, Jeff, I'm going to miss you after Monday. Well, Ned, thank you for that. I'm just getting a little bit emotional. I'm getting very emotional about that. By the way, I just realized I watched a, a documentary last night about Land Rover making electric vehicles. And it was on the Discovery Channel. So here are my points on the micro side. Increase available to credit. Yeah, okay, so contestability in theory should bring down the interest rate on loans, the price, and raise the interest rate on deposits. Because banks are, as somebody said in the chat beautifully, they're desperate to get market share. Uh, a really good point. Somebody posted in chat that they thought that Metro Bank or Revolu or Monzo would be uh, a growth maximizer rather than a profit maximizer. So to gain market share, they'll probably offer a better return on to savers and building societies of course are owned by the savers and not <laughs> owned by shareholders such as northern rock little point there for george so building societies typically offer better interest rates because they use savings as their main source of funding a lot of you by the way talked about efficiency which is i was super pleased about so challenger banks might improve dynamic efficiency new types of loans tremendous apps i'm told i have to get a monzo app on my smartphone and must get one and if you have one maybe give it a shout out personalized financial solutions so a lot of the micro effects probably to do with price consumer surplus was mentioned efficiency really really good answers i mean top answers one more question to go there is no paper four by the way uh that's next year macro effects of an increasing content now can you can you now think synoptically can you give me some macro effects if the uk banking sector becomes more contestable Hey, have a go. There's some quite sophisticated answers coming through here. You, uh, a lot of people are a little bit fragile and flaky on financial economics, but uh, the answers I'm seeing are hugely encouraging. Here's Jake's point about increased interest rates, increasing savings rates could have an effect on aggregate demand. Of course, that's the paradox of thrift, isn't it, Jake? If we all save more, paradoxically, the UK economy slows down. So it's good to save, but um, don't want too much saving. Um, Merlin talked about uh, higher interest rates uh, might attracting foreign hot money into the UK economy. Uh, Harsman talks about increased financial stability due to less systemic risk. Wow, really good point. And then that might make the UK more attractive to fintech investments, for example, coming in. Here's Merlin's point, higher contestability might lead to higher savings rates. Um, so perhaps a better current account. Ah, the hot money flows, of course, is on the financial account. 
So money coming in to the banking system is on the financial account, which is the level it's below the, the uh, current account. The current account, of course, is just X minus M plus primary and secondary income. Yeah, it says, could you link in the Howard Domar model? You certainly could. Probably more relevant, I think, for developing nations where well, you need to lift the rate of saving. But the UK does have a low savings culture and perhaps the challenger banks could help address that, particularly amongst young people, by the way. A lot of people, there's some quite sophisticated behavioural techniques. People have an um, impulse impulse buying. Uh, companies like Monzo and Revolu are using behavioural techniques to, um, to address impulse saving. So you round up a spend and some of that money goes automatically into a deposit account. Interesting stuff. Here are my points. I went for growth and stability. I think Laura made one of the best, um, uh, Laura Samatova made one of the best points I think I've ever seen on these live streams. So if you can bring Laura's point up again. Uh, greater competition can drive commercial banks to allocate resources more efficiently. So a lot of people talking about allocative efficiency, increased investment. Businesses might be able to tap into these challenger banks. A lot of small businesses complain they can't get business loans. They can't get financial credit and trade credit. So maybe that could drive investment, productivity and innovation. And the point, the second point is perhaps more contestability might improve financial stability because go back 15 years, it was dominated by the big banks. Those big banks were thought to be too big to fail and their lending practices um, led to a huge amount of systemic risk. And ultimately, of course, the global financial crisis of 2007 to what, 2023. Interestingly, the parallel, one little parallel point is that they've opened up the they opened up the energy market. Lots of new firms came in, and it didn't really make the energy market any less any more stable. I think challenger banks could be um, could be a really interesting sort of financial question to ask because it's got lots of market structure stuff, and it does have a micro macro aspect. Well, there we go. Uh, absolutely superb. I think those are my three little case studies for this session. So we'll take a pause here. Congratulations to everybody for contributing. Absolutely amazing. I'm going to do one more session, as Ariane Grande would say, one last time. I'm going to do a 25, 30 minute session on poverty and inequality. If you want to revise that with me at one o'clock, hopefully that'll be a nice little lunchtime session. Let's have a working lunch. So bring your sandwiches, bring your coffee, uh, what have you. Bring your nandos to that session. And let's see if we can spend a good focused 20, 25 minutes on poverty and inequality before the weekend kicks in. Thanks to everybody for joining in, as always. If you've enjoyed it, if you found it useful, press the like button. If you've hated every minute of it, uh, please press the like button as well. It helps other people find us. Uh, as always, stay safe, stay happy, stay curious, and hopefully see you sometime soon.